Empower Talks, empowering you through the voice of truth with your host, Dr. Joel Hunter. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Joel Hunter, host of Power Talks, empowering you through the voice of truth. On today's program, Gary Tester, who's the executive director of Catholic Charities, and Donna Walsh, who's the health officer with Seminole County Health Department, are here to educate us about the opioid epidemic. That's easy enough for me to say, and what we can do about it. <laughs> so thanks for coming. These are two good friends of mine. We're, we, we are colleagues and we work closely together. Um, and this response to the opioid epidemic is just unfolding because we don't really have a grand architecture yet. We're trying to figure all this out. Mm -hmm. uh, but Gary, I wanna go to you first because this isn't your first rodeo on this. No, uh, you were a key player um, in the state of Ohio in addressing some of the early stages of this mm -hmm. epidemic. Uh, can you tell us kind of what those components were, what are the main components that need to be addressed as a community tries to respond to this pervasive a problem? Well, Joel, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to sit with you and talk about it. I think realistically speaking, you emphasize the key word, it's community. Mm -hmm. uh, the natural tendency is to assume that um, hospitals have a re uh, responsibility for this because it's health care. Police departments have a responsibility for it because it's law enforcement oriented. And the reality is that all facets of a community are impacted mm -hmm. when it's opioids or frankly any other substance that comes into play. And so I had the privilege uh, for five years of leading a community anti-drug coalition up in Toledo, Ohio mm -hmm. uh, called Toledo Lucas County Cares that brought together all facets of the community to talk about the overall problem and then to create strategies within each sector of the community that interfaced with the other. Mm. So we had strategies that we used in the schools, but the schools interfaced with the public media markets to talk about things that needed to be emphasized. We connected with law enforcement, we connected with healthcare, um, many of the corporate partners, just to come together to talk about a community-oriented approach. Um, and then underlying all of it is the fact that we have to have a champion. We have to have somebody that says, this needs to come together. We, the human tendency, I think, is to silo. Right. And that's just right. the wrong thing to do right now. Right, right. <clears throat> well, I, I, I love that approach, and I love your pointing out that for every um, effort, there needs to be a designated leader who mm -hmm. has a passion about uh, the particular issue. Um, I know in Seminole County, um, Sheriff Lima yes. has, has not only been uh, appointed by our, our Attorney General um, to kind of head up initially at least the state effort, statewide effort, uh, but he really does have a passion about this. Yes, he does. Um, and so we too are a part of the a, 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 a county effort, not just a regional effort, mm -hmm. but a county effort. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> tell us just from a from a county health office, uh, what, how you look at this, how, how you approach this from a county health perspective? Sure, sure. Well, if you, if you look back at, um, in 2017, uh, our governor at the time issued a declaration of a statewide public health emergency, and this was shortly after the Centers for Disease Control issued mm -hmm. an emergency, a public health emergency, because um, as Gary mentioned, this, this does, just doesn't touch one section of our community. This touches everybody. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then, you know, of course, our president's also issued a declaration as well. There's a crisis here. It's, it's not just about the drug overdose. It's not just about the deaths due to the drug overdose, but it's about the unborn child, the neonatal mm. abstinence syndrome. It's the mother mm. that uses drugs during pregnancy. Mm. Um, it's families that are broken apart mm -hmm. because you know parent or parents may be uh, um, users, and then the children end up in foster care. Mm. You know, so we work very closely with the Department of Children and Families as well as the the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and many others. Um, as as Seminole County saw the numbers climbing in 2016. Um, with 62 deaths related to opioid overdose at that time to 83 deaths in 2017 and 82 last year, um, we formed along with the Sheriff's Department or Sheriff's Office an opioid task force. Mm -hmm. It was a, the Opioid and Heroin Task Force in the summer of 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and we have invited over 100 partners to the table. Mm -hmm. um, we had our, our meetings about every other month. To We brought in subject matter experts to talk to us, to frame 
the issue in our community so that we could become educated on how to better approach yeah. um, all of the facets involved, as you mentioned. And so um, Sheriff, you know, has a vision of, of moving things uh, quicker at this point, you know, because we're seeing the numbers continue yeah, to rise. Yeah. And so we, we have to come up with strategies that are effective and, sooner than later. And what are the, there's two directions I want to go here. One, one are the contiguous um, problems that we see ari arising concurrent with the, with the opioid crisis. You mentioned hepatitis A, A yes. um, is on the rise Correct. and they're related in that same population. Um, um, but, um, also, um, oh, I forgot my second one. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, what are the um, what are the, uh, the the partners that you bring in sure. to talk about? I mean, what are the sectors that you bring in sure. from a county sure. perspective to really talk about this issue? Um, they're from all over. So you have your your government sectors. Um, you have your nonprofits, uh, medical community. The hospitals have been very supportive. Yeah. Um, every hospital system, not only in our county, but in the Central Florida area are, are uh, coming together uh -huh. to come up with solutions. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Todd Husty, our medical director for the county, and I right. chair a medical committee yeah. um, with this council, which is now the Opioid Council. Yeah. Um, it's no longer the, the task force, but the Opioid Council. Um, we have four different committees, and each of those committees are made up of community partners yeah. with interest in those areas. So prevention being one of those, public safety and criminal gotcha. justice being another, gotcha. and um, treatment and recovery another. So we, we also work with addiction and recovery agencies, yeah. um, with faith-based organizations, yeah. uh, non-governmental organizations, yeah. so many partners okay. at the table. Let me, let me take off on that. Gary, you, you okay. um, could speak to this. You lead Catholic Charities in our area, which is a really significant um, positive impact uh, on our region. Um, what, why is the faith-based component an important um, partner in this effort? From my perspective, um, both professionally and personally, the reason it's so important is it's the common place where people gather. Mm -hmm. So regardless of your particular faith practice, the reality is is that many of us on, on weekends, this is where we gather, and this is where we gather strength individually, this is where we gather strength as families. So it's an excellent opportunity to provide very basic information uh, regarding um, opioids in this case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I remember back in the day when you mentioned the maternal program, um, I was on an advisory board that created um, one of the first crack baby mm -hmm. um, neonatal mm -hmm. units mm -hmm. um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we had it in Toledo, Ohio at, at St. Vincent uh, Medical Center. Mm -hmm. It's just a way that we pull things together. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that the faith-based community is so important is regardless of faith, the practice, what we talk about is family. And one of the keys here is how do families respond to this crisis? Yeah. If you're a family that's not impacted currently, God bless you yeah. and keep doing all the things you do and, and be ready. If you're a family that is impacted, seek support. And again, the logical place for support, probably not your employer, although your employer may be more than willing to help. You're not going to come and say, hey, I've got this issue. Yeah. But you may come to your pastor and yeah. say, you know, I need this help. Yeah. Absolutely, we'll, we'll mobilize around you. Yeah, good. And I think that's why, why faith-based is so important. Yeah, really, because it's a human problem, isn't it? I mean, these are people. This is not just a clinical you know, approach. No. History, These are people. History repeats itself. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. I mean, my own personal take, we all have a hole in our heart. The hole is created by the Creator. Yeah. And it can only be filled with Him. Right. We're kind of slow. We don't grasp that concept as readily as He might like. Right. And therefore, we go and try and find ways to fill that hole. Right. And we find it hedonistically. Yeah. And that opens the door for all kinds of things to create problems. Mm -hmm. Opioids happen to be the latest in a long line of, of lessons yeah. learned. And, and we, you know, as soon as the crack problem is over, we move into methamphetamine. As soon as methamphetamine is over, we move into the designer drugs. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the designer drugs are over, we are back to opioids, mm -hmm. which is where we were in the 60s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, yeah. it's just a fascinating recurrence, yeah. and, and um, I, I would be remiss, um, this idea of the Opioid Council. Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America um, was formed under 
H.W. Bush. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a way that brings every segment of the community together to talk about what can we work on together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And faith-based has to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to put that uh, website also uh, on the screen, but you're exactly right. Donna, let me come back to the medical aspect just sure. for a moment because um, I know that with 83 deaths in Seminole County, there were, I can't remember the exact figure, how many saves were there from, from Narcan uh, applications. Uh, mm -hmm. There were uh, well over... I think uh, 200 or so that were brought back from the brink of death. Two questions. And the sheriff said something alarming. Um, the best predictor of dying from an overdose is getting saved from an overdose. Right. So it doesn't, just because you've been brought back doesn't yes. mean the problem goes away. Not at all. No. Um, but um, I read something in all of this research that I'm doing. And basically the recommendation is Everybody ought to go out and buy a can of Narcan and then train yourself as to, you know, what the symptoms are. Is that good advice, bad advice? What do you think? Well, um, if, you, if you know of somebody in your family, if you know of a friend who is suffering from this addiction, then it's suggested okay. that you have Narcan gotcha. available. Okay. I mean, ultimately, you would want to get that person help. Right. You know, but it's... Right. it's not only about the save, as you mentioned, because Narcan, Narcan has saved lives yeah. and it will continue to save lives, but that doesn't stop the addiction. Yeah. And so there's so many factors involved in somebody becoming addicted to a right. drug. And, and you mentioned several, um, but behavioral health, having the, the mental health services around the treatment, the medical treatment mm -hmm. um, is so important so that that person doesn't relapse back into that same situation. So to answer your question, it is suggested that Narcan, you have Narcan, and, and you can get this from your local um, pharma pharmacy. Anybody can yes. go into a drugstore and, and buy some. Okay. Correct. Um, and so, but, you know, if you don't think that you're going to encounter anybody mm -hmm. that, that's going to need that substance, you know, that, that treatment, then, you know, I don't think that they're recommending that everybody purchase right. it. Right. But But if you do know of a friend, a family member, and gotcha. so forth, that, that may... That makes sense. Yes. The... the let me ask you this together, uh, because um, um, we we deal with a great panorama of human need. I mean, there are mm -hmm. so many challenges that so many people have. Uh, there are so many parts of our population that are vulnerable, um, and and part of us being coordinated in what we do is kind of like a relay, you know, race. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a medical professional, mm -hmm. you know that after the physical situation is addressed, that there is some sort of um, follow-up that's needed. Right. Um, and and so, what what is your recommendation to medical professionals um, um, about how they refer? individuals or families mm -hmm. to follow mm -hmm. up from an intervention sure. you know say, let's say uh, let's say the sheriff's office or somebody else uh, 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 one of our emergency rescue teams from the fire department or from a uh, hospital have been called out uh, they've intervened successfully um, what happens after that um, and and how can we be sure that the person then isn't left in the same situation, that they at least have mm -hmm. encouragement mm -hmm. to take the next step toward healing. Well, we just had our medical committee, subcommittee meeting recently, and that was a topic of conversation around the table. You know, what are we doing currently and what should we be doing? Mm -hmm. um, I know that Dr. Husty shared a model from South Florida where a, a hospital system was the lead in, in that community um, to, to help with all aspects of healing mm -hmm. you know um, as you mentioned not only the physical healing but the the mental the family counseling and so forth mm -hmm. um, we are looking to duplicate something like that here in Seminole County but there's many steps to take to get there mm -hmm. as I mentioned the hospital systems are very interested and supportive we just need to figure out the details yeah um, in the meantime what we're hearing from our emergency department folks you know a gentleman was present at the meeting is that they they are referring but who's 
doing the management of that particular mm -hmm. family yeah. to make sure they get to their destination. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, that's where we need to connect those dots. Okay. You know, uh, We at the health department um, just started co-locating mental health services last year. Uh -huh. And so um, Hispanic Family co Counseling comes once a week at our health department to provide services. Um, Clean Slate, which is an addiction service, um, they are coming to our Castleberry location and Sanford location at the end of this month to mm -hmm. provide services. Mm -hmm. And we, we opened our doors and we continue to open our doors to community partners for various services because we re realize that the vulnerable populations we serve can't always get to yeah. the places they need mm -hmm. to get. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we want to make it as, as accessible as possible right. for them to receive those services. So I think from a, a number of different approaches, we're, we're starting to see our community partners yeah. either co-locate services, making sure they have case management to follow up on these families. We have some wonderful mental health partners here in Seminole County, Aspire Healthcare being one of those. Um, uh, Shepherd's Hope you know, is a, is mm -hmm. a great destination mm -hmm. as well, um, but it's it's challenging yeah. because you know it's, it's not um, as robust as we would like. Yeah. And so, um, but as you mentioned, with all the partners coming to the table, we are going to work on this and we're going to, to make yeah. it happen. Carrie, so. we, we have, um, in, a, in the Protestant sector of the, of the Christian family, we have a lot of recovery groups, like mm -hmm. Celebrate Recovery mm -hmm. and other kinds of um, groups that meet in our buildings, right. al uh, AA groups, mm -hmm. uh, alcohol, uh, uh, the Al-Anon groups, uh, all kinds of twelve-step groups um, got the same thing in the in the uh, in Catholic charities. Is there any? Is there are there other recovery type groups? What are the what are the how are they called and are they think, open to the public? And yeah, there are groups. Um, uh, we have a number of parishes that support um, your traditional twelve-step programs, um, and and twelve-step programs have evolved. Um, they all take on different facets of, of drug use, but you know the bottom line is we realize that something greater than us yeah. is controlling us, mm -hmm. and then we realize something greater than that can restore us to dignity. It's yeah. essentially that where we are. Part of what we're doing with our behavioral health services, Joel, is, is we have a program called Mental Health First Aid. The Mental Health First Aid program is designed to take mm. all of us and help us to more comfortably interact with folks who yeah. may be experiencing depression, um, um, schizophrenia, um, anxiety, just different types of mental health challenges that ultimately when we get somebody who says, I need help with this drug problem, inevitably underneath, we've got some other pain. Yeah. And so that mental health first aid program is designed to help people comfortably engage and to know when to refer for professional assistance. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the ones we're taking on. And then I've got a, a conversation coming up with a couple of my team members. We're talking about what can we do more specifically to engage in both behavioral health education and behavioral health services to support individuals and families who are struggling with with opioids yeah. let me well let me this okay. stay there for a minute let's camp out on that because okay. because it's there will be many people who are listening and mm -hmm. both of you have mentioned you know if you know someone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you have someone in your family mm -hmm. um, and I know that most people are petrified to, to address this with people they know because they don't want to make it worse. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. You know, how would you instruct them? Uh, those who feel like maybe I should say something, uh, but I don't want to make it worse. I, mm -hmm. But I want people to feel like I'm a safe person and uh, they have the encouragement um, I would be the encouragement for them to, to you know, get help or whatever. How, how do you coach people like that? Just, you know, just kind of the people who don't know anything, but they want to be, help, but they want to be helpful, but mm -hmm. they don't know how. I think it's always first, um, um, don't attack. Um, it's very easy mm -hmm. to fall into the habit of judging. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that I would say, um, putting the old clinical days back on, um, don't do it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, when you're dealing with someone who has an addiction and you try and deal with them one on one, inevitably they'll convince you that you're nuts. Yeah. Um, they will. They'll do, they have a way of making you think that you're the reason that they do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have this fear. I have this fear that if I say too much, I might drive you right out of the house and you'll go and this is the time where you're overdose and you'll die and oh yeah. my God, look what yeah. I just did. Yeah. And so the reality is approach them out of love. 
um, talk with other family members. You're all struggling with the same issue. A circle of friends, a group of folks at, a, at an agency, mm -hmm. uh, a work site, you're all dealing with the same thing. None of us are talking about it together, and that's the beauty of the Opioid Council as it's being described, mm -hmm. the things that CATCA does. We're coming together to talk about it, and that should be reflected all the way down to the family unit yeah. and to the individuals that care about that individual. Yeah, good. And I would say, too, from, from a public health perspective, being a site for people to receive services is building that trust. Um, Faith-based organizations are a trusted entity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so by having that, that trust and looking at holistic care, as you've mentioned, you know, not just um, what appears to be the issue, mm -hmm. early intervention saves lives. Mm -hmm. And yes. so um, we just, you know, I know that it's it's uh, very difficult to confront something like this, but you're going to save that person's life if yeah. you get them into care yeah. um, early enough. And it's it's a journey. Yeah. Um, it's not something that can be um, that can be done in a day or yeah. a month, mm -hmm. but it's a long journey, and it takes a lot of healing. Yeah. It's even well, it's difficult to address it, but it's dangerous not to. Correct. Um, because yes. we can't do nothing and expect it to get better. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, let me ask you the bigger question though, and this is something that all of us are trying to do in tandem right now. How do we present this to an entire community so that mm. so that really the, it, we, are, we're, we are already intentionally and strategically inviting certain partners that we mm -hmm. know about mm -hmm. in. Um, but when it comes to the public, um, especially if they don't know somebody who's struggling with this issue, how do we help them understand um, that this really is an epidemic? And if they, mm -hmm. if, they, if they haven't been impacted so far, wait for a while and they will be. Mm -hmm. Uh, because everyone will know someone who was mm -hmm. impacted by this. So what, what would be your counsel to those who say, um, I, I, wa I want to be a part of this, I want to alert my network, mm -hmm. I just don't know how to go about it. Well, there, there's a number of campaigns out there, um, Dr. Hunter. The state has come up, Department of Health has come up with a campaign last July called Take Control. Okay. And it's um, a website you can go on to. There's questions and answers for um, pr medical providers as well as for the general public. So I think the, the approach is to continue to talk about it wherever we are. Great. It doesn't have to be a doctor's office. Yeah. It could be a church. Mm -hmm. It could be, um, you know, when you visit the grocery store. Continue to raise awareness, have a conversation around the issue. Right. Um, refer people to, to credible um, sources mm -hmm. so that they can get the right information mm -hmm. and um, and continue to encourage them to say something. Yeah. Good. Anything I think to add here? When, when we talked before, Joel, um, at that meeting with faith-based leaders, I think realistically speaking, prevention um, takes three different forms. There's awareness, there's education, and there's training. Mm. What we're talking about here is awareness. We yeah. just want folks to be aware that there's an issue, and, and there are different ways to do that, and it's always about how do we make it personal. Yeah. Um, when, when I was in, in uh, working as a clinical therapist with kids who had alcohol and drug issues many, many years ago, um, one of the things we always talk about with young people is the, the, an alcoholic can't get help until they hit bottom. Mm -hmm. We used to trip the kids so they'd hit bottom faster, <laughs> oh. and, and that's yeah. one of the things we talk about yeah. nowadays. It's yeah. like... We have to be sensitive to the issues that are out there, and it's if we can talk about what it does in schools, you know, what it does um, uh, in the grocery store, right. you know, things that just everyday life right. that makes it more real. It's not meant to terrify or scare. Right. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be a practical approach. To it. it really is all around us. Right. Um, and, and the more aware of that beco we become and the more capable we become of saying, you know, that bothers me. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about my neighbor, but I... The, when we do talk about it, we make progress, just yeah. as she indicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and part of a huge challenge together, and this has been said at practically every minute, meeting I've been to, is to destigmatize this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we're, uh, you know, I can say as a, as a faith leader, uh, we're some of the, we the worst because we, we, we always think everything in terms of right or wrong or good or bad. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, but there, there are, um, uh, this is a chronic medical condition. Mm -hmm. um, it does involve choice and it involves some poor choices, 
But that doesn't uh, that doesn't stigmatize the individuals, right. um, saying they're different than any of the rest of us. A, a lot, especially with this epidemic, mm -hmm. uh, many of them um, became hooked because they were prescribed from trusted physicians mm -hmm. appropriate treatment for a legitimate injury mm -hmm. or sickness, um, sure. and 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 so um, I think. Gary, your words, uh, first of all, don't attack. Um, mm -hmm. Don't judge, condemn. This is not the business we're in. That's not helpful. Um, um, so uh, we'll get like two minutes left here. I can't believe this is going so fast. Um, so wh what do you see for the future? I, I feel very fortunate living in Central Florida. Yes. We've got a great community mm -hmm. here. We do. Um, and so um, what are your hopes for the future? Um, just in the next two years? Well, certainly we want to see a, a decline in the number of opioid-related opioid, opioid -related deaths, not just opioids, any, any drug-related mm -hmm, deaths, mm -hmm. because, you know, in some of our counties throughout the state, meth, meth may be the issue instead mm -hmm. of, you know, opioids. Yeah. So um, certainly a decline in that. And if we could develop um, a treatment center that would that would house and, and welcome everyone who needs that help. Gotcha. Um, so increasing our resources to address the, the problem gotcha. and to get everybody to a healthy place. You know, yeah. that's that's always our goal in public health is, yeah. you know, addressing all, all aspects of health and families, individuals and so forth, getting yeah. them to a healthy place so they don't feel the need to go to something like Good. this. Anything to add? Yeah, yeah I, I think that's um, great suggestions and I think all I would point out along those lines is it's really important that we understand we need to break ourselves of the habit of starting up and responding to a crisis and as soon as that drug goes away mm -hmm. we're okay yeah, yeah. We're, we're not you know th there's great research out that shows that families that eat a meal together at least once a week are families that develop internal resiliency to alcohol and drug use yeah. it's it's scientific research but we only talk about it when we're in the midst of a crisis, yeah, that it. should be constant messaging from all of us. You sure. betcha. And it makes life a whole lot better whether it, it's a crisis it, or not. It really does. So, well, we are out of time, but I want to thank you uh, and our panelists, Gary Tester and Donna Walsh, for joining us on Power Talks. Remember, these discussions are just that, discussions among us, but we'd love to see you continue the discussions at home or go one step further. Get involved. Because when power talks, you're empowered through the voice of truth. See you next time. You just watched Power Talks, a Good Life 45 original production that makes you part of our hope team. Here on Good Life 45, where hope happens. <laughs>